to Miguel Connor. Hi, Miguel. Hello, yeah. thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's a, um, you know, your voice, as I was saying before we hit record, I've been listening to you for quite some time, actually. Um, and uh, you've been a bit of an inspiration to me. <laughs> so um, I have a traditional first question, which is, what do you do? What do I do? I'd like to do, I'd like to think I do what should be done. I tell stories in different ways. I express myself in a way to try to understand myself. And at the end of the day, I uh, try to uh, take the great journey of self-knowledge to find out uh, what my purpose is. And sometimes it's nice when you can uh, pay some bills while you do that, but there's no guarantee. <laughs> That's a brilliant answer. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I guess I should say I'm the host of Aeon by Gnostic Radio. We can, I guess I gonna, throw we're that gonna, in there. <laughs> we'll stumble onto that. <laughs> All <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so the thing is, obviously, I know you from podcasting, um, listen, listening to your podcast. Um, and you've been doing this for quite some time. So I really want to want to sort of go back because obviously what inspired you to to do what you do must have started quite a while back, I guess. Yeah, are you talking about the podcast? How it got started? Yeah, just, well, actually, you know your journey because you 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 mentioned it. You know that you're a storyteller. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always been a, a storyteller, a, a writer. I have written and published novels and books. Uh, so yeah, to be able to uh, create uh, new realities, uh, never been. I've always been a seeker, but I've never been satisfied with the reality that is presented to us. And I still am not. I think there's something, as Morpheus says in the Matrix to Neo, you know there's something wrong with the world, but you don't know what it is. It's like yeah. a splinter in your mind driving you mad. Yeah, exactly. And I always felt like that. And I think that's most artists, musicians feel that way. And somehow expressing themselves, find some sort of... Uh, self-knowledge, acceptance, or even in a way, rewriting a reality. I, uh, somebody who was uh, very much inspired and a bona fide Gnostic would be William Blake. And to him, imagination was a, a, a true faculty of the mind. It was, as the, the Gnostic said, was our divine spark. Yeah. And uh, I've always been inspired because he believed that by creating art, we could uh, bring something new into the universe to make the universe better. Yes. And we could also change the hearts and souls of, Peter, of people uh, to make them better, to make them more whole. So I definitely would say, I believe that's what I want to do. And I believe every human being has that capability. I mean, if we have if we have, as the Gnostic said, the mind of God and God is just this giant consciousness speculating, contemplating, imagining universes, then when each uh, one of us should have that ability to and really tap into it. I know I'm going full blown mystic right off the bat. No, but, no, that's, know, that's it's, absolutely. It's Saturday. It's Saturday, and as Elton John, Saturday's all right for fighting. <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, um, I was, I was doing an interview uh, yesterday with um, Dr. Dr. Al Cummings. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but um, we were talking about the fact that here in the UK, there's just layer upon layer of, you know, history. Wherever you go, you're walking on, you know, centuries of stuff. Mm, and, yeah, um, lovely. And the thing is that Blake, uh, lived just a couple of roads down from where I worked in London as a, when I first got a job. Wow. And, um, and originally I worked in a bank for a while. Um, and <clears throat> this bank, the original branch of it back in 18, you know, 10 or something, 
was in Hercules Road where Blake lived. Mm. And I used to go down into the vaults because they had the original ledgers there. And I used to sit and thumb through these ledgers to see whether I could find, you know, a deposit from a, a Mr. William Blake. But of course, he didn't have any money <laughs> anyway. So it was highly yeah. unlikely he would have been saving any. But, um, <laughs> it was, you know, it was sort of being in that place where, you know, you saying about your imagination, it really fired it off for me. Um, so I've always been intrigued by, like you, you're saying about what we can term as reality. And I think the thing about music and, and art and all the rest of it is that it does play with that in a, in a big way. You know, what is it? What is, what is reality? And, and your, your program, which obviously we're going to talk about a bit, a bit later on, but um, it really sort of questions so much of what we perceive as being, you know, true or real or whatever. And I find that really refreshing, actually, as a musician and an artist. Yeah, I mean, so when did you first yeah. get that inkling that something wasn't right? <laughs> oh, right off the bat as a kid. There was just a sense I, I didn't fit in. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I used to be that kind of kid. I don't know if you were the same. You read fantasy novels or watch movies. You got, if only I was born in the Middle Ages and could carry a sword, or if yeah. I was born in the frontier and, you know, explore with a gun. And yeah. oh, if I was only back in the, I wish I'd been an adult in the 60s and doing LSD with Jimi Hendrix or something like that. But yeah. as you realize it, it's like, no, any of these places wouldn't work for me. It's, uh, you're out of place. I mean, again, William Blake probably felt out of place too. He was a unique individual with unique experiences and ideas and he did his best. So even as a kid, I just felt that there was something more and one of the best places to feel, to explore this and to feel alive was in my own imagination and my own creation of art. And also, of course, uh, reading others who had similar experiences. I mean, all of us, at our age, probably sat in the dark listening to some musician. It might have been Pink Floyd or Bob Dylan or the Eagle, whatever. Yeah. And we're like, oh, they get it. And they're they're almost taking us to a world of possibilities. They can and they can relate to this eternal exploration. Um, I think uh, maybe that's a it's a humanity thing when we're honest with ourselves. We are very different than other species. We have metacognition. We can think abstractly. We're the pretty much, as far as we know, the only animal that knows that we are going to die. So that creates a, a, a lot of possibilities, but also a huge burden. And so uh, I think as humans, we are the caretakers of the cosmos, but at the same time, it's almost like we don't, we'll never belong. And if you look at our impact and the environment and the world, we're not exactly... <laughs> <laughs> the best friends with mother nature if you know what i mean so uh, i'm not saying we were deposited here by aliens anything's possible as the older i get the more i tell myself anything's possible everything's <laughs> on the table so. yeah yeah i think that, that that's an interesting thing it's uh i think anybody who spends any amount of time questioning stuff comes to that sort of realization that there's a there's a very strange thing you know dichotomy going on between the fact that we've got well these skill sets I suppose is the best way to put it you know even from making fire um, mm -hmm. onwards that sets us apart from other things in a way that's good and bad and 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 even you know any whatever pantheon you you look at has got that sort of almost a reflection of human consciousness within it, you know, gods who do this and gods who do that and goddesses that do whatever. And, you know, they're never, they're never the sort of nice cuddly characters, just like <laughs> we're not. And, um, and I think obviously going back to Blake, because, you know, you've raised him, it um, raised the sort of thing about Blake's vision of the world. I mean, his, his artwork reflects that sort of, extraordinary not necessarily very pleasant but magnificent picture of what he viewed creation to be which was it's unparalleled yeah. 
Yes, and you're you're a hundred percent right. Uh, it is very gnostic because it's depictions of uh, the end of days or God so seem to show some sort of demented mm. individual some yeah. being that's in pain very much as the Gnostics thought of the demiurge that rule the world and as you said uh, reality seems to be a forlorn place a place with ex existential angst but there's also beauty and elegance in his art so yeah there's nothing like William Blake's work uh, his art it's incredible mm, amazing so when when did you start writing or telling stories or was that very early on was that one of these things that yeah I was always a storyteller I mean like all kids I had imagination but I was very good at getting others into my imagination toys and all other things and I was the type of kid who was uh it'd be in class uh and I'd be drawing on a paper without the teacher seeing me battle scenes or mm -hmm. space ports or all that other thing that was uh yeah school was just uh pure horror it was a yeah, well, that, kind of yeah. it's kind of getting you prepared for the prison that is this planet is school yeah. it's uh totally. the natural okay now you've you've hit on something which i think is worth pursuing a bit um it, I, i've been involved in education for for most of my life but as you know somebody goes into a school and teaches kids to play rock music and then goes home again. Uh -huh. um, right. But the, the problem is with it is that you, you look at that and you think, well, particularly when you realize that education has been used, been used to, well, at best corral people and at worst completely destroy their culture. You know, we've used education to um, take away the culture of, Aboriginal people and all the rest of it, and and yet we we always think that it's a good thing. <laughs> I'm not saying that oh, not yeah, the educated, but, but the framework is <laughs> is horrendous, you know. Um, <sighs> and I think when you sort of become and and I've always been aware that that the kids who seem to have learning difficulties, right? I'll put this in the inverted commas, seem to be the kids who actually know what's happening uh, in a lot of cases. And they just don't fit in. And they know that they don't like the system. I've seen that so often. And, uh, you know, the, the kids who are the troublemakers, you know, the ones who are, whatever, <laughs> they're actually, they've actually got more going on in their head, you know, about this. Right. They can see things as they are, that there's something not right, which going back to our matrix um, meme, if you like, you know, something that sort of, irritates you about the system um so you would, yeah it's uh go ahead yeah i was going to say you know would you say that that you have really got that early on and that started to drive you more yeah i mean it was uh it was definitely soul breaking uh, and of course it, it drove me to escape the problem is it drove me to escape in the wrong ways experimenting mm -hmm. with drugs uh petty crime you know vandal the usual yeah, well, they're the kids I'm talking about. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. uh, there, here's an example. I mean, of course, this one size fits all is horrible. And we know that the Western education system was imported from the Prussian Empire in the 19th century. And it was this, it was a way of making good, obedient, industrial revolution workers that can turn yeah. levers and not not ask too many questions, but it's it's destroyed the collective soul. I mean, somebody... I don't know why it came into my head. You, you look at somebody like um, John Lennon. Yes. John Lennon abandoned by his mother and his father, I believe, and raised by his aunt. Uh, very creative, uh, probably an empathic soul, uh, mystic vision kind of guy. Goes to school. He's a troublemaker. Probably made it worse. Is able to break through into music. Music is sort of his salvation, but... The issues don't go away so that's why john was so cruel to his first wife and he was to uh, julian lennon too abusive and uh, a person that was full of anger of subconscious anger and self-hate until he got finally got some real therapy in the 70s and you look at somebody the school system probably made him worse there wasn't any sort of support where somebody could say you know this kid really needs some sort of therapy on the side to sort of manage because he's obviously a troubled kid, but he's also a very bright kid. So let's make let's work with him to make him better. But again, 
somebody like John Lennon or me or you were thrown into this uh, factory and uh, it, uh, we start seeking in the wrong places. We suppress what we shouldn't suppress so we can be, cope with uh, reality to the best of our abilities. And let's face it, I don't know how it is in the UK, but here in the United States, I think 80% of kids will, find, will encounter their first instance of violence at school. It's not at their home with their parents or on the streets or any, it's at school when they are children. So that just tells you something's very, you know, again, Morpheus wrong. <laughs> totally. I mean, I, okay. The education system that I grew up in and the ones that I see now, there is an improvement in the way that children are respected. Yeah, same here. There is a yeah. better, yeah. But I mean, when I grew up, it was... Yeah. No, every man, every kid on is for his, for himself. You're going to get bullied. The teacher's going to pick on you. You're screwed. Yes, You're just screwed. exactly. So. so when after you know when you left school, because you said there was a lot of stuff went on early on <laughs> for you. Um, when you was there a moment where you started to sort of go, where you, you started to. Get your shit together, basically, you know, where you, you sort of thought, ah, hang on a minute. And you had something that you could direct that energy. Is there a moment when you sort of go like an aha moment? Or was it a gradual thing? No, it's more like periods of Satori, periods of denial, mm -hmm. periods of psychosis. Uh, unfortunately, even as I thrived in many ways, like in my... Um, in my late 20s, I was able to get a, a book with Warner Books, a big deal. But unfortunately, I was still dealing like John Lennon with my own demons. I didn't understand the pain that was going inside of me. Uh, hadn't found a spiritual practice. I was still in, still, still a Catholic, Roman Catholic. So I get a book published, but at the same time, I'm being self-destructive by drinking and doing drugs on one side, eventually just burn bridges with this publisher so it's sort of the back and forth or i experiment at a at a hindu ashram and i'm having good uh, insights but at the same time i'm still living a life of doing recreational drugs so it's this sort of a back and forth and pain and uh, yeah. it was really only until unfortunately not for unfortunately this is very fortunate um you, I, you hit rock bottom a couple of times in my uh, 30s and then in my 40s and uh, as they say in, a, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and other places, that's the best time. When you hit rock bottom is the is when you stop digging. That's how you know you've hit rock bottom. So then you're like, OK, the universe has kicked my ass. My ego is shattered. It's time to rebuild and sort of walk to the light. And then you find insights and find the right therapy. You find insights about your childhood. I discovered I was a manic depressant. Uh, uh, rapid cycler bipolar you discover that you do have uh, that if you stay sober and focus you can create you can it's better for creating art instead of the lie that the you know the Ernest Hemingway or yeah. Jimi Hendrix again you got to be high off your ass to could create good art which is bullshit and then you just and then I started uh, on this journey of self-knowledge and got involved um, you know discovered the Gnostics who, like William Blake, uh, answered a lot of questions about the, the, the nature of the universe, the nature of reality, and then things uh, get better. And as I tell people, there's no end to this self-discovery. You oh, and absolutely. me, we are endless. We are endless. There is no, we could go lifetimes and we're going to discover so much about ourselves. Yeah, that's, that's, that's such a, yeah, that's, that's such a brilliant way of putting it. Um, I think also the other thing is that, you know, you're talking about Hemi Hemingway and, and Hendrix and this sort of idea that to be really creative, you've got to be like mad. You know, you've got to have lost it. <laughs> Breaking guitars and yeah, high yeah, off yeah, your yeah. ass. Yeah, only I, Keith I, Richards has gotten away with it, it seems. <laughs> well, yeah, but you see, the thing is, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, Richards is another creature, but if you... <laughs> He's I, I from lived, another I, planet. Yeah, it's called Dartford. I, I lived in Dartford, and, and there's uh, like a race of people that look like Keith Richards. I can assure you, and um, they're really, almost, they're almost <laughs> indestructible. Um, mm. 
Yeah, um, I had a load of mates like it as well. So it's, it's wow. bizarre. No, talking, sort of joking aside, uh, the thing about people like Hendrix, I think a lot of it is is a bit of a bit of a hype because uh, okay, yeah, they were they were doing stuff and everything, but not all the time. And, and lots of things, you know, because I I was I was talking to I was talking to uh, John Etheridge, who's used to be he's a guitarist for Soft Machine, and and mm. John knew Jimmy, you know, uh, John was mm. in his teens, and 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 Hendrix. You know, used to go and see him play and stuff like that. Wow. Um, and he's, you know, you get this sort of story about Hendrix as, as the gentleman, you know, this really quietly spoken gentleman. And mm-hmm. the more people that you, you speak to who actually knew Jimmy, the more that character comes out instead of this guy who was literally out of control or seemingly, you know, and that's where his great uh, creativity was coming. He was, was a sensitive and, soul. Yeah, he was a very sensitive soul, but I think in in a lot of cases he wasn't quite out there as people probably sort of imagined he was. So I'm just, you know, I'm 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 always a bit bit wary of some of those stories, you know, um, because it's not it doesn't seem to be the, the the picture of the of the of the guy when you speak to people who've met him, you know. Um, yeah, but if he was a drug addict like I was, uh, he was. Oh yeah, yeah. There'd be there's moments. No, there's there was... no ifs or buts. He was in no, distress no. and yeah, no, he needed it, help, and it's a yeah. pity that it yes, ended. He certainly did, but I think also he was unlucky. I mean, if you look at people like Clapton, yeah, who seem to just manage to somehow scrape through when he was in a pretty <laughs> bad place with everything, and he, yeah, and then, yeah. his story is bizarre at the beginning. You know, being brought up by his, I think it was by his grandma thinking that he's his auntie, you know, the person who was his auntie right. was his mum. Mm-hmm. And he never knew right. until he was quite old, you know, well, you know, he was in his teens, I think, before he actually knew that that was the situation. And that must oh, really just... That must have broken his psyche, poor thing. What? Crazy. Yeah. What, what yeah. would that do to you? I mean, the archetype of the mother is not, you know, you don't mess with that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so... You said you had a book deal, and you wrote you wrote a book for you said Warner Brook books, which was it seems like a big, yes, correct big thing. So um, there's a lot of stuff. Obviously, must have happened before you got the book deal. I mean, you must have. There's obviously it's a great talent there. Um, was you aware that, that 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 was you know you had that. Or was that just something that you... Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, yeah, I did believe in myself. I did know uh, there was a, a place for me. I enjoyed fantasy and science fiction from uh, Tolkien to Michael Moorcock, Roger Zelasny, of course, Philip K. Dick. Uh, yeah. Just uh, I, I love science fiction and I love playing with the idea of alternate worlds and parallel universes and uh, possible futures so yeah. and I wrote I wrote a lot of short stories uh, back this is back in the yeah this is back in the 90s where there was actually a lot more magazines out there and they would pay you and you'd, you'd uh, sell your stories to digest and so forth so it did lead up to the book and yeah. um, unfortunately the success that was the that was the that also broke me it definitely broke uh well it increased my addiction um, yeah. my psychosis and so forth is uh, i mean sort of like the old woody allen i'm afraid of failure but i'm also afraid of success you're yeah, sort yeah, of this yeah, bardo yeah. where you don't want either one to happen and while you're waiting for either one to happen you're um, numbing yourself with uh, alcohol drugs and other material pursuits so yeah that's what happened yeah, because it is a massive psychological thing that goes on when people get some some level of success anyway, isn't it? I mean, I don't know how, you know, there seems to be a lot of luck involved in, in people who become successful like musicians and stuff and suddenly they're thrust into the limelight and it's from like nowhere. And sometimes it can happen so quick um, that, uh, you know, they're not really prepared for it in any shape or form. Not, not that you could necessarily suddenly be prepared to become like one of the biggest things going you know that's be difficult mm-hmm. but um oh yeah i'm sure so when so when do you when do you get to the point where the gnostic you're you're sort of uh looking into gnosticism starts to 
you know, equate into the books and and, and um, the podcasting because you had uh, uh, your podcast was called something else earlier on, wasn't it? Cigarettes and yeah, coffee, Gnosis. cigarettes, and Gnosis, Gnosis, and yeah. that was 2006. I think the Gnostic thing was already there. If you look at the novel I published with Warner Books, it was called, uh, back then it was called The Queen of Darkness, and then uh, they gave me the rights, whatever, 15 years later, and I republished it for myself as Stargazer. Oh. But it is about, yeah, it is about... Uh, it's very Gnostic, needless to say. I don't want to give away the plot, but it is about a reality that's completely false and individuals asking questions. And he finds out that his society, his goddess, everything is a sham and goes to war with this new reality to help uh, others escape this reality. And when I wrote this book, I, I think uh, I went to Catholic University, a priest once mentioned about the Gnostics, and he simply said, stay away from their work. And that, that was basically it. I didn't know anything about their theology or anything else. So, uh, and this is... Away from it, it's like, hello. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, I think it's within us. Uh, what did uh, uh, Gnostic Bishop Stephen Heller said? Every serious artist is already halfway a Gnostic because yeah. when you begin to explore your inner world, when you see the nature of our culture, our society, even reality, you're going to get to some Gnostic conclusions on the nature of evil, suffering, uh, who we are. And even individuals like Philip K. Dick, he had a Gnostic vision before. Mm -hmm he even started exploring or Carl Jung he had studied uh, the Gnostics a little bit for research for one book on on the libido or you know something not even related to mythology or ancient religion and then he had his red book visions and then he went back he was like hmm this seems familiar and he started studying the Gnostics heavily and he said oh my god this aligned my cosmology in the red book and the Gnostics align perfectly. So I think each one of us will come to those realizations. And it's almost like you might say it's um, uh, a zero one, zero one kind of game. There's part of us that is Gnostic that wants to uh, get out of this world, take the red pill with Neo and go to war. And there's another part of us that just wants to uh, no, order is fine. The system's fine. We'll make the best of it. We'll just be good. Uh, so, uh, but the artist really kind of brings about this Dionysian uh, side of us. Yes, yes, yes. Amazing. Right. So when, when, so when you got this, this is starting. When, when, so in two thousand six, you said you, you started the podcast. Correct. <clears throat> this that's pretty early days in podcasting, isn't it? Yeah, it was nothing really. Uh, that was I don't think even there was iTunes or RSS feeds. Uh, I was going to say, uh, what there was the idea to do that. I mean, it's like I, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, yeah I was uh, I was I was following uh, this. It was called Free Thought Media, and it was atheist and humanist, and it was sort of a there was a, there was these sort of independent internet radio stations. Yeah. And it was, there were a great alternative to radio and sort of the precursor to the podcast yeah. because they had the ability to create and broadcast uh, podcasts within a, a good ecosystem. So this one was really focuses on, on atheism. And I would, I would listen to them because, uh, you know, part of me becoming an Gnostic was also the deprogramming, uh, trying to understand religion and all that. So the new atheist movement was, what do they say? Uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, and I remember just had an idea. I was also getting interested in Gnosticism and I went to the, uh, to the owner of Free Thought Media and I said, hey, how about you give me a slot on Sundays at seven and I do a podcast and I, I do a show on Gnosticism. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah. A lot of people who are historically minded are interested, but nobody knows much about the Gnostics. So, um, I was very lucky that I was able to, it was going to be a temporary thing. I thought it would be more like a course, like a seven to 10, but I was very lucky to get individuals like um, Bart Ehrman, uh, uh, Timothy Freak, uh, some of the translators of the Nag Hammadi library, the quote unquote oh. Gnostic gospels. And oh. it went really well. And I just kept doing it. I kept saying, uh, whoa, I've done seven or eight shows. Uh, you know what? 
I haven't even scratched the surface. Let's keep exploring. And it just, and it was never weekly. Uh, once eventually free thought media collapsed, it just went out of business. Again, I think uh, by 2009, 10, suddenly podcasts were starting to rise. So I, I kept at it. I, I rebranded it A.M. Biden. I wouldn't really put it out every week. It was sometimes bi-weekly, sometimes only once or twice a month or once a month. And uh, it, it just kept growing and it was never, it was sort of always a side project. And it was only like 2000, late 2018 that I had again, uh, I learned my lesson in life. I had sort of a crisis and I've learned that whenever you have a crisis, whether it's uh, existential, depression, anxiety, the best thing you can do is beat it by creating even harder, as they say, just give the world even more beauty or art and let your soul release. So I went full time in late 2018 and I started putting five, four, I started out four and then five and sometimes six shows a, uh, a month plus increasing my writing, everything else. So, uh, mm. and that's how it's been. And since I did that, it's grown maybe a hundred times and well, here we are amazing. in 2021. Yeah. Yes. It's uh in 2021 uh, when the pandemic hit or the lockdowns or i don't know wherever stance you are on this but when it hit uh the show even grew even more because obviously people were search people were confused people were isolated they were searching for alternative ideas even health spirituality politics and and then i said well now that things are going back to normal uh, I know the UK is not there yet, but here in the USA, it's already been months. We've been we've been open for months, and some states have been open since like uh, February. Yeah. They're just like, ah, we just don't care, you know. Like Singapore, yeah. oh, we're just gonna live with it. Screw it. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And um, it's I thought, well, now everybody's gonna go back to their normal world of work and this and that, and the show keeps growing even even as things go back to normal so hopefully it's a good thing because i'm not saying i'm this uh spiritual leader but other alternative podcasts or you know they're also growing too because i think people want more choices people realize that our governments and institutions haven't uh haven't worked and they haven't been good caretakers to us in the last year or two no 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 <laughs> That's the same. no matter what side you're on i think you yeah. can yeah, it's the same. It, oh, God, yeah. Well, I won't, I won't start off about the UK, but there we go. Um, <laughs> sure. we, we've got our own. We've got our own shit to deal with. Your own archons to deal with. Oh, I'm telling you. <laughs> anyway, but um, no, that's, that, that, that's fascinating. That you're saying about how you you've used you know the the, the the struggles that you've had to drive your creativity. That that actually is a is a way of. Um, you know, bringing some sort of solace to, to uh, you know, um, to your world. You know, because I, I, I truly believe that. You know, that music and art, and I, I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm sort of in the process of writing a book about the sort of impact that music can have. Um, you know, historically. Oh, lovely, lovely. But, but you know, art, and music have always been, well, magical. Basically, putting it in a mm -hmm. nutshell. You know, it wouldn't have just been commoditized in the way that we've done it now. And of course, that's, that it's the same with stories, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. storytelling would have been a way of unlocking people's way of seeing the world. You know, the idea that I did a podcast with a guy who's, who, who's um, sort of an expert on Norse myths. And, and he was saying that, you know, we sort of forget, we, we've got this thing about uh, the, the, the Greek, you know, the idea of logic and everything. He said, but, you know, if you went back to that, you would have had the logos, the logic, but you would also have had mythos. And they would have known what deals with what, you know, instead of it being a one size fits all, that everything is logical and all the rest of it. The whole thing about stories and plays and art and, and all the rest of it was expressing a world that we could not explain Logically, mm -hmm. you, and you sort of look at that and you think, well, that's sort of obvious, you know, when you, you look at things, there's some things that are unknowable from a perspective as, of us being able to dissect it and separate it out. And as soon as you get into that thing of realizing a lot of those structures, like, you know, with Gnosticism, looking at 
things and going, well, who is this God? <laughs> what, <laughs> what on earth's going on here? And whether that's a metaphor for, you know, all the structures that go on in society that you think, well, who are they for? Which is back again to the thing of the kid, you know, looking in school that thinks, I don't like this. There's something that sort of smells a bit funny here. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, you look at that and it runs right through, doesn't it? And I think when it comes to great art, you know, great artists, they're the ones who sort of sit in that sort of zone that's like, yep, this is not, you know, the, the rebellious attitude of looking at, things and distort it you know taking reality and breaking it you know what we think is reality and, and breaking it and seeing what comes out of that you know distorting pictures you know whether it's a Picasso or you know seeing the world differently uh, it's sort of, I, I just find that fascinating you know um, yeah well said I mean I always liked uh well, there was a quote by Doctor Who, Matt Smith, and he says, our souls are not made of atoms, they're made of stories. That was an aha moment for me because I realized, yeah, the, the entire universe is made of narrative. Uh, the propaganda is narrative. What we tell ourselves uh, for our identities is a narrative that we bought into, but we can create better narratives and as far as myth yeah the myth is the secret language of the soul as joseph campbell said to understand transcendental truths myth is the best thing we can do are those stories that get us very close to those primordial symbols and archetypes that dwell in the collective unconscious or beyond the stars so myth is more than stories is uh, oh, these are the it's, 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 it's a yeah, it's an it's a it's its own true science or art that gives us a sense of perspective and meaning and belonging to the universe, to our tribe, and to the future and the past. And um, as far as art, I do like what uh, P. D. Spency once said in the Fourth Way. He said, um, "All true art is, in fact, nothing but an attempt to transmit the sensation of ecstasy." And only the man who finds in it this state of ecstasy will understand and feel art. Now, obviously, we think uh, in our modern times, ecstasy is something like, uh, uh, I don't know, physical sexual pleasure. But ecstasy in the Greek means getting out of your head. Mm -hmm. That moment you are outside of your ego and we're out, I'm outside of Miguel and this construct that is Miguel. And I can see everything at once for what it is. And I can see beyond all the constructs of this uh, universe. And it's honestly, uh, that type of ecstasy is, uh, it's the best feeling ever. And like you said, art and myth gets us there. Yes, totally. Now tell me a little bit about your, your, your um, how you do, you know, you, you arrived at your form of the podcast, because I think you've got one of the best introductions in the podcast. <laughs> In that was a happy accident yeah pure happy accident uh again you have to think it, it evolved my intros because it for, in 2006 getting good quality sound like you and i are getting is was very hard it was just you were rolling the dice yes. um so even my intros and the interviews would sound very choppy so i said shit what am i gonna do so i said oh if i put some background music it'll hide uh, you know the clicks and the glitches and then uh, you know and then I said man my pacing is really off so why don't I throw an intro or kind of the those throwaway days of kind of radio where they would throw special effects and quotes here and there and I said wow there's a whole bunch there's like I'm learning about Gnostic there's a galaxy of Gnostic movies from the Truman Show to the Matrix to uh to Westworld. So I just started throwing uh, quotes there to sort of give people a relation and understanding of what Gnosticism is. Because again, with art, you can really teach people better. Yes. So I can sit there and go, well, you know, there's a, and you know, the first century, these Christians believed in a hypostasis called Sophia. And these were the Gnostics. And people are like, <sighs> But if I say, okay, here's a quote from The Matrix, they're yeah. like, ah, this is interesting. I get what he's trying to say about these Gnostics. And, yeah. and it sort of evolved and it became my own form of therapy too. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah, way of expressing. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. you must spend hours on those 
things because they're all completely different from one another, aren't they? I mean, you got okay, you got some things. Yeah, that, I'd say about you know, yeah, two or three hours for an intro. Yeah, yeah. sometimes less. But that's that's amazing. Because, uh, the interesting thing is, of course, you recognise some of them, some of the clips, but then there's the the annoying ones that you think, where did that come from? I, I, what is that? <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't understand why people get annoyed about. No, no, that. what I'm saying is, it's I've been a, no, it no, I'm saying people me. literally get annoyed at me. Oh, do they? Oh. Like, <laughs> well, you got to list your your movie clips, and I'm like, look, when I am <laughs> no, on another podcast, no, and I'm somebody, I just I just type it in in the Google bar. So yeah, you know, yeah, he no, said this. And, yeah, no, no, no. What what I meant was, it was nicely annoying. It's sort of like it sort of draws you into it. It's like. From. You're trying to rack your brains to to work out who, whose voice that was, and, and um, yeah, so no, it's good. It's it's unique. I mean, I have to say, I don't think anybody has ever done that type of intro. No, I've not heard anybody uh, else do that. Yeah. No, so I, I found my niche, my originality, and again, it's cathartic. And and I know so many people they hate them, but then it just grows on them, and they can't get enough of it. And and at the end of the day, is I understand how human beings are because, for example, if I listen to a podcast and they have commercials or they're talking about the weather or whatever, I just move the cursor to where I want it. Yeah. But sometimes people want to complain to complain. And I'm the, the best one. I mean, I sit in front of the TV and like, oh, look at this blowhard. God, I hate him. And my kids will be like, well, why don't you change the channel or do the fast forward? It's like, no, I want to complain. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be irate and offended. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Human nature. Human yeah, I, mean, nature. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I think you're right. So, um, what uh, you know, what, what one of the things that um, I was going to ask you is, what do you do you see as you were so early in to podcasting? Where do you see it going? Oh, it's oh, that's a lovely a good, time. Question, but... Yeah, it's a lovely time. I'm glad you're doing this podcast. I hope more people will do it. It's a uh, the the old ways again. I don't know how it is in the UK, but here in the United States, the legacy media is collapsing. Newspapers, yeah. uh, TV stations, and, and so it's wonderful because it's so decentralized. And as yeah. they call it, this is the golden age of podcasting, where we can all offer alternative uh, information, views, and each one of us can be, as they call it here, a creator and find your niche. I mean, we I love this time because we don't have to wait to hit it big and to be John Lennon or Jimi Hendrix. Uh, each of us can become our own maybe expert or uh, influencer, if you would, on a different topic, on a different niche. And we can find those people who are like-minded, who are ready for this information and who will benefit and become more free through this information. So I love it. It's the golden age of podcasting. Unlike YouTube and other social media platforms, there hasn't been much censorship with the RSS feeds on iTunes and other places if you've noticed. So there is more free speech and free expression. So right now it's it's a good time. And again, I would tell people, don't, don't get yourself into the idea you've got to be famous. You've got to be Joe Rogan or something like that. Find, nice. find your niche, find your crowd and slowly network with other like-minded people. And you'll be happier because again, I love talking about Gnosticism and I wouldn't want to do anything else. No, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, it's a great way of learning, learning the thing you're interested in as well, isn't it? It's like a, mm -hmm. I often say to people, if you want to be a really great musician, teach it. Yeah, it's like yeah. anything. It's like as soon as you start, like for me, because obviously it's quite a broad spectrum what I'm doing from the point of view about creativity, because it means I can interview musicians, um, and I can inter interview people like yourself, or you know somebody who's a a tarot reader or a, or a storyteller right. or a, you know or a, somebody who's um who lives by foraging or whatever you know it, literally it's like these people are doing something creative with their own lives mm -hmm. and um and it also sort of broadens out the fact that you you learn things about yourself in the way that my own assumptions about things even though i'm quite flexible in the way i think 
could be challenged by certain things. And then I realized that I was making an assumption which was completely wrong, you know, about <laughs> something. And, and it's been the best way of me learning about what I do. It's amazing. It's incredible. So, I, yeah, I, yeah. It's self knowledge. You're discovering, yeah, you are discovering aspects of yourself you never knew you had and it's a it's a wonderful feeling and i think that's why you people should go into podcasting and i wish everybody would get it let's let's smash these systems and we don't have to go out there with a guillotine or no. the hong kong protesters everybody become an artist i think william blake would be very proud of that that each yes. one of us taps into our creativity our curiosity our wanting to reach out to others and I think that's that's how we're going to make a big difference in the world. And I think all of us podcasters, you and I, are making a difference. Well, I think that's 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 a brilliant point. Um, I mean, you saying that quote about William Blake, and, and, you know, you would be very happy to think that everybody was you know, showing that they are artists. I I, I interviewed. Um, he wouldn't have died unknown. He would have had his own podcast and had his own <laughs> he little would group. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he would have had 40 to 50 people. At least he could talk to every week that loved his work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I interviewed Satish Kumar, who's a peace activist. Um, this guy was, uh -huh. became very famous for, for walking from India to, to, uh, to Moscow and then Paris and then London. And then he got, somebody gave him a ticket to, to go to America. And then walk to Washington uh, with no money. Wow. I mean, he's a Gandhian, you know. Um, but he said in India, there's this thing of saying artists aren't a very uh, aren't a special kind of person. Every person is a special kind of artist. Mm. And I thought that really sort of summed that up for me. That yeah, yeah. Kind of, you know, if people Brilliant. could become just do what they do, basically, whatever that is, mm -hmm. you know, whatever their life story is. I think it's very, very important. So just one other, just one other real burning question I've got is how no do you problem. get such amazing people on your podcast? <laughs> because you do have the most amazing collection of people. You were saying that uh, early on, you got uh, Tim, was it Tim, Tim, Tim Freak? Tim Freak. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's quite an, an array of people that you have. Well, well, I think at first there was there must have been some providence. Uh, again, I was able to get Elaine Pagels, translators of the yeah. Nag Library. Uh, yeah. But I think in time it just became as I, especially in the last few years, it's just uh, reputation. I love what I do. I treat all of my guests well. Yeah. Uh, I've written books on Gnosticism. So I just have... Uh, a good reputation because again people see I'm professional and I'm also passionate about what I'm doing I don't have any sort of a agenda I mean all my philosophical political commentaries are kind of high a high view they're not I don't take a stance or I'm very I'm not very public about my stances because if I'm going to fight, if I'm going to talk about politics, I've had a fight with my family. Why talk with strangers out there in the social media, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> that's what family's for. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that's it. I think that's it. I tried to, uh, yeah, this is the place if you want to talk about Gnostic ideas and hermetic ideas. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Well, Miguel, that's, that's just been a brilliant chat, mate. It's, uh, you know, it's nice to hear your voice uh, again, because, you know, you, you've, you have got a great, broadcasting voice i must say um but uh you know um, thank you so yeah it's, it's a if only if only my wife and kids thought my voice was so convincing if only <laughs> <laughs> yes but let's face it you know when you're very good at communicating sometimes the people that are very really close to you like your kids and your wife doesn't yeah. seem to work on them uh, you know, it doesn't. No, what did uh, Ram Ram Das famously say? If you want to find out how enlightened you are, spend a week with your family. Exactly. He's hundred. I mean, all our progress and evolution just sort of falls down on a holiday week with the family, or something. Exactly, and that's uh, that, that explains a lot about the Desert Fathers. I would say, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's much easier to go and sit in the middle of the desert on a pole, thirty foot up in the air, and then right. You know, 
and you know because you don't have to deal with your family that way so but that's spiritual bypassing which is one of the great dangers that <laughs> western the people fall no you can't go to the mountain or to heaven the work is done here exactly and it, it's done with other human beings your individuation exactly. is done right here yeah exactly and that's a that's a brilliant note to finish on so so thank you very much it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you um Oh, enjoyed it too. Thank you for having me yes, on. That's great. And um, yeah, you know, hopefully one day at some point, if ever you're over in the UK, you never know. Oh, of course. Take me to see uh, William Blake sites. I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah, it'd be cool. <laughs> anyway, thanks ever so much, mate. It's really cool. Thank you. Well, big thanks to um, Miguel. Um, he's got such a great sounding voice, hasn't he? Amazing. Uh, check out Aeon Bright Gnostic Radio, which is uh, the podcast that Miguel runs. Um, and if you go to his site, and the, all the links will be in the show notes, um, all of his uh, sort of books and, and stuff like that are on there, I believe. Um, yeah. So until next time, I'll see you then. Cheers. Mm-hmm.